So welcome everyone and good evening to you. Our, our program tonight is ladybugs, fireflies, and much, much more. Insect biodiversity with a focus on beetle. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dwayne McKenna from the University of Memphis, I want to thank our presenting sponsors for the 2021 Summer Lecture Series. Our corporate sponsor is Buckman, and our foundation sponsor is the Crawford Howard Family Foundation. We also want to thank our 2021 benefactors, AutoZone, Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, J.A. Griffles Foundation, Hyde Family Foundation, International Paper, and Ring Container Technologies, all for their ongoing support. All of our supporters, corporations, community organizations, and individual donors, and volunteers are critically important in allowing us to deliver on our mission the protection and enhancement of the Wolf River watershed as a sustainable natural resource. As always, gifts of any size are appreciated, so please check for the donation link in the chat box. I would also like to let you know or announce tonight that our annual Greenway Soiree will be on Saturday, November the 6th. Please check our website at www.wolfriver.org forward slash soiree for additional information. A few housekeeping details. We ask that you not record this program with any device as it is being recorded tonight for our, our, our own purposes. Also, when you have questions for Dr. McKenna during the program, please use the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Our education director, Kathy, will monitor the chat box and ask the questions at the end of the program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dwayne McKenna. Dr. McKenna is the William Hill Professor of Biology in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Memphis and founding director of the University of Memphis Center for Biodiversity Research. He is an entomologist specializing in the study of insect evolution, insect plant interactions, insect genomes, and insect biodiversity and conservation. His research projects involve all seven continents. In addition to insects, he is interested in the plant phylogeny and evolution, and the flora and vegetation of temperate North America and the Neotropics. He has worked as a botanist for the state of Michigan and the Nature Conservancy, and he has been engaged in conservation-related policy engagement and education and outreach for more than 25 years. Very impressive. Please welcome Dr. McKenna. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And, you know, um, one of the things that I do like to share is that while a professor currently, my background was initially in the landscapes around me, where I grew up and where I found myself during the course of my education. And so now here in the Memphis area for 11 years, um, have really come to really appreciate and enjoy the landscapes here, the, the wild places in particular, including the Wolf River and its environments. So. I'm happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you. As far as my talk today, what I'll be sharing with you initially is some very general information about the remarkable biodiversity and features of insects in ecosystems, the ways in which they enrich our lives and enrich our quality of life. I'm also going to talk about the current status of insect biodiversity. I'll introduce you a little bit to some of the work that I do um, in that sense, sort of taking a little bit of a, a change of pace and becoming a bit more academic for a moment. When I finish with that, I'm then gonna close by sharing with you some just sort of fun information, including certainly photographs and some anecdotes about insects that I've encountered along the Wolf River Greenway here in Germantown, Tennessee, where I live. And for that matter, just some interesting bits of biology that I think that you might enjoy. Um, in doing so, what I hope to do is speak to different individuals in the audience uh, with different interests, and in, and in that sense, kind of surveying a number of my own interests as well, um, not to mention insect-plant interactions, but really focusing largely on uh, insects in this area themselves. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and let's see here one moment. And if you'll bear with me, my computer likes to make me re-authenticate screen share each time. So just one moment.
Okay, so this should work for us now. Let's try this again. Here we are. All right. So at this point, you should be able to see my screen. I'm going to go ahead and open up my initial slide here. And so one thing I want to start with is by sharing that I have a couple of friends in particular here that you'll see, um, Alex Wild and Piotr Nesgrecki, who are extraordinary nature photographers. And so they've been very kind in allowing me to use their photos in my presentations. And so I just want to, at the front end of things, acknowledge that. You'll see then their photos all acknowledged here. Any that are not acknowledged are my own. Um, and so at any rate, I um, want to make sure that you can see the wonderful work that they have done. So just a really quick uh, extension on my background. Um, you can see me in this picture here in Australia, standing next to a really large fig tree in a um, tropical humid rainforest. Um, I, I truly love being in the field. And while much of what I do these days is in the laboratory or even administrative in many ways, um, like so many of you, I, I think there's really no more wonderful a place to be than in nature itself. And one thing that's apparent in this picture, of course, is plants, right? So setting aside the photos alongside this image, you can see that plants are, of course, what we use as biologists, or for that matter, just as individuals in the landscape to interpret what's around us. That's how we establish whether we are in a forest or in a grassland or maybe a farm field. Um, and so at any rate, plants are very apparent. And by way of their apparency, they're exceedingly important in the environment. That's one reason why early on for me, I was drawn to an interest in plants. My, my interest in plants came in many ways, um, even a little bit before my interest in insects. Now, insects, on the other hand, are extraordinarily species rich. They are diverse. They are so poorly known, in fact, that it's a lot easier to tell you what we don't know in some cases than it is really to say what we do. Insects are, though, in the case of their interactions with plants, exceedingly important. And between the two, you have then, biologically speaking, the most diverse lineage of organisms on Earth, the insects, at least macroscopic organisms anyway. And you have, in the case of plants, also a lot of diversity, but some of the most apparent organisms in every landscape. So for a person like myself, who has always been fascinated with the diversity of life, that interface between the diversity of insects and the appearance of plants and ecosystems has been a really fun and satisfying place to be. And that's where my research has been really since the very beginning. And so while I'm a specialist on beetles in particular within the insects, much of the work that I do is at this interface between insects and plants. All right, so the picture alongside of it here, you can see beetles on the left-hand side, just some examples of some of the amazing diversity that's in that group. On the right, in particular, flowering plants, um, and then a couple of gymnosperms as well. But the idea being here that within these two groups, there's just no shortage of really exciting questions. Now, just as a sort of very general high-level kind of overview, I want to highlight some of the reasons why insects are really remarkable and very important to study. For one, they're essential to the way that nature functions. They, of course, recycle things. Dung, dead animals, wood, leaves. Those things which would otherwise accumulate in the environment, otherwise be problematic by way of their accumulation, are recycled by insects. And by way of recycling them, it provides resources, nutrients, raw materials, if you will, to other organisms that can be used as building blocks or in other ways. They're also important, of course, in pollination. And that's something we're all familiar with. It's in the news. We know that this is an issue as well with the decline in pollinators. But I think what we have not really fully appreciated is the diversity of insects that are involved in pollination. And it's really quite a remarkable thing. In fact, studying beetles, I like to remind people, or maybe tell them for the first time, that in fact, beetles are probably among the first insect pollinators, probably the first, in fact, at least among extant insects, things that are alive today, way before the butterflies, probably well before bees as well. They're also among the most diverse pollinators, more varieties of beetles interacting with more varieties of plants, perhaps than any other group of insects. It's debatable, it's not well documented, but it is probably the case. We also know that insects are important in seed dispersal. Again, something largely neglected, something not very well understood in most forest settings, but in the leaf litter in particular, we have ants and lots of other organisms, mostly insects, that are moving around seeds. 
Of course, insects are also food for other animals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, of course, it goes on and on. Again, unless you're really sitting and watching animals in nature, you may not fully appreciate the many ways in which they're feeding upon insects and otherwise benefiting from the presence of insects in the environment. So before I move on here, I just had a question that I wanted to ask all of you, just to kind of get you thinking about uh, insects sort of in pop culture even, but certainly as their relevance to our state of Tennessee. So I have a question and I'd like you to try to answer this to the best of your ability. So how approximately, how many individual insects are alive at any one time? So at this very moment on this planet, without regard to what kinds, just counting them all up, every termite, every ant, every fly, every mosquito, what do you think? All right, so we're getting a lot of answers coming in, almost everyone now. We'll give it just a moment more. Looks like we got about 30 seconds to get those last ones in. All right, so with the answers in, I've got nearly a tie between 10 quintillion and 10 quadrillion. 39% for quintillion, 38% for quadrillion. And then a smaller number of folks thought maybe 10 trillion or 10 billion. So looking at those, you pretty clearly chose the big numbers. Can't blame you for that. Let me go on to the next slide here and show you what we've got. So at any one time, approximately 10 quintillion individual insects are alive. It's a pretty extraordinary number. So the insects then are abundant and they are everywhere. They are 2 billion times more numerous than humans. And as a scientist, one of the things that I think is quite remarkable about that is to consider as well that they also have typically short generation times. So that in a given span of time, not only are there a lot of individuals at any one moment, but a large number of individual insects will have lived in a given, let's say one year. And why that's important as a biologist or as a scientist is because during that time then, insects can undergo lots of change. Lots of evolutionary change can occur in populations as a consequence of the application, let's say, of insecticides or exposure to other environmental features that might be new or otherwise different than previous generations. So insects exhibit remarkable features that are in many ways in large part a reflection of scale, how many there are how many different kinds there are, and their generation times, how quickly they turn over, and the resulting impacts that can have on population genetic processes. So another question for you. Approximately how many insect species have been given names by scientists, rather than you know just saying it's a wasp, an actual very specific name given just to that one species? Now this one, you seem to be more definitive. The answers are coming in pretty quick. Okay, so with the answers in, the winner here is 1 million with 38% of those who responded, but a close second with 34%, is 500,000. Third to that, 20% of folks said 100,000. So again, not surprising, right? You chose the big numbers. We know insects are really diverse. We know that there's a lot out there that we need to put names on, if you will. So at this point, what we have put names to is about 1 million species. So of the 1.36 or so million named species of animals, one million or almost three out of four are insects. And by the way, studying beetles, I, I wanna mention that of that one million, 400,000 of those are beetles. 
So insects are the most diverse group of animals. And so when we think of the most diverse groups of animals, you know, we, we have all been taught for many years that it's insects, but not without a lot of nuance, it, or I should say, but not with much nuance. I should mention that within the insects though, there's quite a bit of variation from one group to the next in terms of how many species there are. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that when I turn to a brief discussion of beetles on a later slide. But I'll just point out that wasps, bees, ants, that group, which is the order Hymenoptera, then the beetles, which is the order Coleoptera, the um, cicadas, aphids, and their relatives, another group, the homoptera, as we used to call them, and the hemiptera, which we now call them. So these groups together, along with the butterflies and moths and the flies, account for the most of insect diversity. But what's apparent across most insect groups, especially the really big groups where the diversity is just astounding, most species have not been studied or named. And it's even true that many species have not been discovered. So the distinction between those is you can go in a museum and it's really easy to find species that are preserved in museum collections, which we know exist, but which have not yet been given names. It's also not too difficult in much of the world to go out and find insects that in fact have not been discovered, or at least do not reside in collections and are not on people's radar, if you will. That's especially easy in the tropics. The estimated real diversity of insects, if we were to account for all of the species that are alive in nature today, is somewhere between three and 80 million species. And, and the consensus is that it's probably closer to around seven to maybe 10 million. What's, what's true here though, if by this range you can see is that we don't know that much. There's a pretty broad range given here. All right. So insects of course are really important in lots and lots of ways, not the least of which is to our economy, our jobs and food security. Really important positive economic impacts and kind of human nature here that we don't account for most of them. In fact, this number more than 1 trillion is kind of the best you can do, realizing that it could easily be an order of magnitude too little. There's a huge positive economic impact. The reality though is that we don't fully quantify or perhaps appreciate what that impact is. What we do know though is that by way of ecosystem services, ways in which insects benefit us through the ways they benefit the environment we live in are extraordinary. They are huge. And you've probably heard things like, if you eliminated insects, it wouldn't be too much later that humans in fact would really struggle to persist. Of course, we have no real clear knowledge of how that would all play out, but the reality is we know that terrestrial ecosystems as we know them would fail to operate in the ways that we know that they operate if we were to lose insects from the system. So there are of course negative impacts. Economic impacts that insects have to agriculture by consuming foods and other things that would be sold, commodities and so on, is pretty substantial. They consume or destroy 10 to 25% of goods and services produced each year. And that amount of loss is somewhere in the order of $10 trillion or more. So huge, huge negative impacts as well. We also know that they have negative impacts on human health. They're vectors for disease, in particular Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, malaria, plague, typhus, West Nile, yellow fever, and so on. Again, these are all to some degree familiar, I'm sure, because in some of these are resurgent, they're sort of increasing in frequency in recent years. Um, and for many of you, if you're like me, you're reminded of this in the summers as you hear you know, mosquito foggers driving down the roadways and um, really attempt to reduce populations of vectors. So these kinds of disease vectoring insects are abundant and widespread and are a part of living in, uh, in the landscape here, even in Tennessee. So I'm gonna change just a bit to a different question. This one just sort of getting you to think about um, insects here in our sort of pop culture um, and so on. So, you know, it's not uncommon that states have established a state insect or insects. And so just wanna curious to know what you know of Tennessee. What is the state insect of Tennessee? Let's see if you can choose from the options I've got here.
A lot of diversity in answers here, no clear winner yet. Okay, so with all the answers in, if you chose ladybug, you are right. If you chose honeybee, you are right. <laughs> if you chose firefly, you're also right. And the zebra swallowtail, it's in fact all of them. And so in the state of Tennessee, unlike many states, we actually have multiple state insects, four of them. I'm gonna go ahead and show you just a little bit about each of these and, and, and sort of just give you a little bit of background behind it. So fireflies, which are of course beetles, not flies. Um, there are quite a few species in Tennessee in the group, the family Lampyridae, which is the firefly family. Um, within that family, there are not too terribly many species which actually function to light up and, and act as fireflies. In, in Western Tennessee, I'm not certain exactly how many we have, but it's on the order of a couple dozen or so. And so at any rate, the one though, the firefly that is our state firefly is Photinus pyralis, which is this Eastern firefly. And uh, it goes by a number of different names. At any rate though, you can see it pretty abundantly on a nice summer evening here in Tennessee and in West Tennessee in particular, it's abundant. I see it in my yard and so on. Um, so that is, one of our state insects. It was established this one in 1975, and so was the lady beetle, which I'll show you in a minute. We also have a state agricultural insect, the honeybee, and this was established in 1990. So what I think is kind of funny, if you look at the Secretary of State website for the state of Tennessee, that's where this information came from. In fact, I screenshotted it directly from there. I have to say it's a little bit funny that for the ladybug, the actual state ladybug is the seven-spotted ladybug, which is not what's shown here. <laughs> um, this is Hippodamia convergens. But at any rate, um, our state ladybug, in this case, as one of our state insects, is the seven-spotted. And that one is here. So this is Coccinella septum punctata, the seven-spotted ladybug. And you can see that on its front wings, which we call four wings, which are hardened, and they're this orange, black, and white part of the body here, you can see that there are in fact seven spots if you were to count them. So that's the seven spotted ladybug. All right, so I'm gonna change pace a little bit. And what I'd like to do for the middle part of my talk or presentation to you today is to tell you just a little bit about uh, what we do in terms of the research in my lab. So very generally, I study insect systematics, genomics, evolution, and diversity. And what that means is I'm interested in understanding how it is that insects are related to one another. I'm interested in the time frame over which they have occurred on this planet, how they've diversified into the varied forms that we see like beetles and flies and butterflies. And at the same time, the diversity of biology that we see. Um, I'm also interested in how they interact with plants as I've mentioned before, and the genes in their genomes that allow them to do the amazing things that they do. Beyond that, it's really kind of cool that as you travel the world, you see that different insects occur in different places. And it's not just random. There's really remarkable pattern in that, such that the tropics, not surprisingly, is very diverse. The temperate zone, less so. But the temperate zone in the north temperate zone is different from the south temperate zone. And in the south temperate zone, south temperate South America, Australia, places like South Africa have interesting connections by way of their historical biogeography, as we would call it. So the way that the continents were once distributed in the past is reflected today in the kinds of insects that we see in these places. So I study those sorts of things as well. I'm also interested in conservation and the global biodiversity crisis, which I'll touch on at the end of my talk today. So as I said, I study beetles, the order Coleoptera, and they're distinctive among insects in having their front wings, their fore wings, as we call them, hardened into what we call elytra. And you can see in these pictures, these are all beetles with one exception where the wings are expanded. You can see the front wings, which are used to protect the hind wings, the hind wings typically being used for flight. They're dorsal ventrally flattened, which means they're kind of like a pancake where they're squished down against the ground almost as if they need to squeeze under surfaces. And in fact, that's what they can do very well. They have a mouth parts, which are adapted for chewing. 
And that's unlike something like, let's say, a butterfly, which has a long tube-like or straw-like mouthpart, which it uses for sucking and lapping up nectar. So why do I study beetles or why would anyone study them? Well, they're extraordinarily diverse, as I've already mentioned. In fact, arguably, because wasps, bees, and their relatives are also similarly diverse, they're arguably the most diverse group of insects, about 400,000 with names. This is, as I mentioned before, about a third of insect species, about a fifth of all animal species on this planet. And I suspect, you know, on my own experience and things that other people have done, there's probably over 1 million, maybe about one and a half million species in reality. So only about one in three of those, or maybe one in four has a name today. Now beetles also, many of them at least, are really good at feeding on plants. And they are important pests of agriculture, forestry, certainly even in our gardens. And this includes a lot of familiar ones, even those that were familiar in the past, but are not much of an issue today, things like the cotton boll weevil. Um, but, but certainly these are names you know, Asian longhorn beetle, various kinds of bark beetles that eat conifer trees and kill them, the emerald ash borer, and so on. They also exhibit an extraordinary diversity of form and function. So I think it's kind of amazing to imagine that a beetle, you know, looking at the top here, 0.31 inches, or excuse me, millimeters long, that's the smallest beetle. Imagine that inside that little body, all the same things have to happen as happens in the largest beetle, which is almost seven inches long, more than 560 fold variation in body size. It's remarkable. And so to think that those bodies are functioning, the physics of it all, the physiology of it all is really quite remarkable. Weight is similarly variable, 288,000 fold variation the volume of those bodies also similarly varied. On the bottom of the slide here and on the next one, which I'll show in a moment, I've actually just shown you some of the variation present in a single group of beetles. So there are about 190 families or major groups of beetles. And in this picture here, I'm showing you just some examples from within just one of those families, the weevil family, Herculeonidae. So weevils, as you can see them here, typically have a long rostrum or, if you will, mouth part. It's kind of like, in this case of the one in the upper right, it's one that's kind of like a straw, right? But it's, it's varied and, and quite remarkably different across different species. And you can see coloration and size and all sorts of remarkable other different features. Pretty cool stuff. Um, here's a similar picture with some of the same ones and more. So again, within one family, a remarkable, remarkable diversity of different body forms and a lot, a lot of different interesting biology to study. So one of the things we study in my lab is the evolution of specialized plant feeding. And what I mean by that is beetles and other insects don't typically just go out and chew on any plant part. There's very specific ways in which they do it, and they are species specific. So this weevil shown on screen here feeds on the margin of leaves of a given group of plants that produces a nasty latex. You can see it here exuding out of the leaf. Others of them mine within the leaf. They feed between layers of leaf tissue, never actually leaving the leaf until they're ready to come out as an adult. Others of them will chew only on stems or bore into wood, feed on roots, you name it, they'll do it. Beetles of various kinds have a remarkable diversity of ways of feeding on plants. So one thing that we and many others have been working on now is the genes that beetles and other insects are using to feed on plants effectively. Because, you know, think about it, right? If you and I were stranded in a forest somewhere, you know, imagine that, and you needed something to eat, you couldn't just walk over to the nearest tree and start chewing on it, right? I mean, it doesn't even occur to us because we can't eat wood. And frankly, most plant material is either distasteful or would otherwise make us sick. So the same holds, in fact, for insects. They can't just eat anything. And those that do feed in those ways have evolved some pretty remarkable ways of doing it. So one thing that has become apparent in the last 10 years or so is that the genomes of certain beetles that feed on plants have enzymes encoded in them. They have genes which encode these enzymes, which the beetles then use to break down plant parts, plant parts that other organisms typically can't eat, in particular, the cell walls themselves. So beetles, many of them, can actually eat wood, and they can do just fine eating wood. 
Very few other animals can do that. Those that can typically require partners to do it, symbionts, other little microorganisms that live within those animals that help them to break down plant tissues. You know, so think of bovines, cows and their relatives, and many other grazers. Um, lots of animals that are not beetles, or I should say lots of insects that are not beetles do the same thing. They partner with other microorganisms to help eat woody and other plant tissues. But in fact, there are several groups of beetles that can do this just fine on their own because they have in their genomes genes which allow them to break down plant cell walls. And that's really important, of course, in industrial applications as well. And it is a whole other conversation here, but the fact that they can do this is pretty interesting and unique. Well, what we've found out in particular is that there's about five beetle families of the 190 families that can do this. The genes they use to do it, they originally obtained by horizontal gene transfer. Those genes were transferred into their genomes from other organisms, in particular, fungi and bacteria. They've been in their genomes for millions of years. Since making their way into the beetle genomes, those genes have diversified in the genomes by way of beetle evolutionary histories and are now really diverse within these lineages that can do this and allow beetles to do a lot of cool things that other plant feeding insects can't do. In particular, what we find is that unlike other insects like termites that have similar metabolic capabilities, these beetles don't need microorganisms. They can feed on plants pretty well to some degree at least, without microorganisms to supplement their diets. And because of this, we propose that this was a key innovation in the diversification of beetles, and for that matter, other insects that can do this. That is, by having these genes, they were able to do things that other insects couldn't. And by way of doing those things and being able to feed on lots of different plants, over time, these groups of beetles were very, very successful. Now, initially, we just propose this. We, we kind of thought this would likely be the case. What we found by studying these genes and then building a family tree for beetles and looking for where those beetle groups diversified both in time and in the phylogeny, we found, and I'm going to show you that on this next couple of slides, this is a beetle family tree. You don't need to take it all in other than to know that we took genomes and then all of the information we could about the genes beetles were using uh, when they were feeding on plants. And we looked across the phylogeny at where these genes were and were not. And on this slide, what you can kind of see here, and I'm just going to walk through it real quick. This is that same family tree. And all you need to know is it's calibrated for time here so that the deeper branches are older groups of beetles. On the right, you can see these colored boxes show you the groups of beetles with each of various of these genes. And I've just blown up the map showing you what these genes are on the left. The details don't matter so much. What does matter is to notice that there's a big, not a big, there's a diversity of those genes here and a diversity of those genes here. Otherwise, they're kind of scattered across beetle groups. Well, those groups are the metallic wood boring beetles and the weevils, leaf beetles, and longhorn beetles. Here I've summarized that data in a slightly different way, where you can see that there's a whole diversity of these genes in the metallic wood boring beetles and a whole diversity in this other group as well, the leaf, longhorn, and weevil beetles. Well, if you look at the number of species in these groups, you can see they're pretty diverse. But what's notable about them in particular, you have this group, 125,000 species with names. And this group, 14,700, these two groups happen to be the only successful, really successful, really diverse lineages of plant feeding beetles. There's lots of others that feed on plants, but they're not diverse, nor are they as ecologically successful as we've seen. So this slide is just showing you the family trees we then built for the genes themselves. And what you should get out of this is not all the little details, but what I want you to know is that by building family trees for the genes, we could figure out where the genes originated the actual origins of those genes, which it turns out are bacteria and fungi. I did mention that before, I know, but we were able to show that these genes were actually transferred horizontally from the genomes of fungi and bacteria, which had evolved very long ago the ability to break down woody plant components into the genomes of beetles. We don't know how this happened exactly, although there's some interesting ways that which it, with which it could happen, and with some colleagues, we're looking into that. So 
what we see is that there are these increases in beetle diversification rate along the branches in the beetle family tree where these genes appear. So what it means is that when these genes appeared in beetle genomes, it allowed beetles to do things they couldn't do before. And as a consequence of that, they were really successful, those lineages. There were a lot of them. I mean, that increase in diversification rate that we documented is a consequence of those lineages being really successful that have these genes. So these genes allowed beetles to feed on plants in ways it would seem that they weren't as capable of before. It also highlights the important role that microorganisms have played in mediating these kinds of interactions in nature. And it's not surprising, right? I mean, we've learned these things in so many other contexts, not to mention even our own health and welfare. So I wanna quickly walk through with you a summary of the ways in which um, insects have interacted with plants over time, because I think this is kind of interesting. It also kind of highlights the, the long time frame over which insects have evolved and interacted with plants in the landscape. So to begin, we have the first insect relatives about 480 million years ago in the fossil record, the first insects at about 440 million years ago. Now why that's important is, that's the same time we first see plants on land. So what we actually believe to have happened, and this is some work that we've published with lots of other people in the past, um, just one small part of a very large group, we showed that insects and plants emerged, if you will, from the water together, because in fact, the ancestors of insects on land are actually crustaceans. The same for the plants that occur on land. Their ancestors are also in the aquatic environment, particular marine, we think, and other uh, at least emergent aquatic terrestrial environments. So it would seem that insect plant interactions on land have their origins in the marine environment, if you will, to some extent. We don't understand all the details by any means. But even so, this happened at the same time. So what it means is that insects and plants have been interacting on land for more than 400 million years. Beetles appear about 300 million years ago. You've got the first conifers and their relatives about 320 million years. So that's going to be cycads and then eventually pines and other trees which we're familiar with. We have this mass extinction event at about 250 million years called the, well, it, it, under, it has a number of different names, but the, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Beetles made it through that mass extinction. Just after that mass extinction, we see the first dinosaurs about 240 million years ago. Beetles had already been around for almost 100 million years. Insects had been around for 200 million years. The first flowering plants about 160 or so million years ago, maybe a little earlier than that. Then we see the dominance of flowering plants, pushing out those gymnospermous plants and others which had dominated previously. We then have this interesting diversity of insects feeding on flowering plants, pretty recent though. We have then this mass extinction event at 65 million years ago that many of you are familiar with because it was the end of the dinosaurs. So the KT mass extinction event. So looking at these two red arrows, you can see that the dinosaurs then, they were around for about you know, 190 million years, a really long time, but still not even half as long as insects have been around, about as half as long as beetles have been around. So beetles and other insects have made it through these two mass extinction events. Carrying on, we see the earth getting really warm in the early Paleogene and a really great diversity of tropical insects appearing on earth. And here we are today in the midst of a third mass extinction, we're not going to lose insects entirely. We're not going to lose beetles entirely, but insects are declining dramatically. And I want to point that out as something we should be exceedingly concerned about, given the reality that insects have done really well through past mass extinction events. So the reality that they're not doing so well or are not poised to do well if things continue as they are now doesn't bode too well for what we're up against in the years to come. All right. Again, a bit of a change of pace. What I want to do with the time that I have left is just share with you some things from my own time um, in the landscape here, in particular along the Germantown Greenway, not too far from my home. And it's a place that I've enjoyed over the years spending time with my family. Um, in particular, though, some of the pictures here, most of the pictures here have been taken within the last few months because uh, we moved much closer. And so almost every day I'm out on the Greenway for a little while with my wife or my children. 
And so just to share a few of the interesting things that you just see in, in regular sort of uh, passing as you're out there, it's kind of awesome. You know, with the passing of the seasons, even you see different things. We have lots of different cicadas in our landscape. One in particular that's abundant out there is the swamp cicada. And uh, these are regularly, you have to avoid stepping on them on the trail as you walk along the Wolf River. Um, another really common, but not very oft observed insect along, well, pretty much anywhere in the landscape around here, are mantid flies. And this is just a, sort of a beautiful picture that I wanted to share with you. Um, I took this with my wife's um, phone when we were walking the other day, maybe just two weeks ago. Uh, you don't see this species very much because it's usually up high, and for that matter, they're fairly seasonal. But they have raptorial front legs, kind of like a praying mantid, but they're nothing at all related to praying mantids. They're in a group called the Neuropterida, which is a, a relatively near relative of beetles. And you can see this one is wrangling with an ant right on the trail. I had to pick it up and actually move it off for fear of it getting run over or stepped on. Um, this is a, a, a beetle that you can encounter uh, out there, again, very seasonal, but it has a wide distribution in Tennessee. Um, but it's a wood borer that feeds on um, mostly on hardwoods, but is a relative generalist and one of the prettier beetles that we have in our area. It's one of those metallic wood boring beetles that I mentioned earlier. And so it has some of these genes in its genome that allow it to break down plant cell walls. And they're pretty fantastic animals. Uh, another, just again, these are sort of random, but just pictures I wanted to share with you. This is a megalomorph spider. Um, I've never seen this species before, but I encountered it walking on the greenway. I slipped a little note that I had with me in my pocket underneath just so you could see it a little better against the asphalt. It's about two inches across, so it's a pretty impressive animal. Um, and again, I hadn't seen that before, and I believe that's because I did a little reading uh, about them, and the males go about looking for females and moving around for only a short period of time in the summer. And so this was in early July. Um, Malodon, the hardwood stump borer. This is a longhorn beetle that's really common in our area, even if not often observed. And this female was actually actively ovipositing um, on a uh, liquid ambar, um, a gumball uh, tree that had been damaged as they were putting in the, the latest stretch of the greenway. And so she was laying her eggs in the exposed wood along the side of the trail. Um, Batis filinora, the pipevine swallowtail, really common along the green line because its host plant, Aristolochia, um, is, uh, and, and I don't know with certainty the common name in our area here, um, Dutchman's pipe is what I would call it further north, but it's a vine with big chordate heart-shaped leaves that's very common along the trail. It's a, a floodplain forest specialist, typically this, this vine. And so this um, butterfly, which is really quite beautiful, uh, does very well along the Wolf River. Um, I should also mention that it, it loves to nectar on albizia. And so even though albizia, which is a mimosa-like tree that's invasive, non-native, that grows regularly along our waterways here. Even though that's not something we'd love to have in the landscape, the, the tree, uh, these pipevine swallowtails just love it. And as you walk over some of the um, little bridge walkways on the Green Line Trail in Germantown, and you look down at the drainages below, you can see down at the top of some of these albizias, and they're just covered in pipevine swallowtails. Another uh, real charismatic beetle that you can see along the green line abundantly at the right times in June and July is the eyed click beetle. So this is about two to two and a half inches long. It's our largest click beetle and one of our largest beetles. Totally harmless. The larvae are predaceous, mostly on other insect larvae, but also um, pretty much anything they encounter in the soil. And the adults are pretty active during the day. And I've been on walks uh, on the Green Line Trail where I've seen two or three of the, these on a single walks. So they're not in, uh, they're not uncommon to encounter. Of course, we all know Japanese beetles. I put this one in here because it's remarkable to me how many different plant species along the Green Line these feed on. Dozens and dozens and dozens in different plant families. They love plants in the rosaceae, the roses, and their relatives. Um, but and this is an elderberry uh, that that these are on. But if you walk the Green Line Trail right now. These are dead for the most part. You won't find any more Japanese beetles, but you'll see the damage from them on almost everything. It's pretty remarkable. It's about now when you start to see Gulf fritillaries as well, starting to make their way up. They don't have resident populations in our area, but they will come up here from the south. 
and establish in areas where there's a little bit of passion flower growing. And there's some, of course, along the roadsides near the uh, Green Line in Germantown. And these do pretty well there. We all know, of course, carpenter bees as a bit of a nuisance around our homes and they're abundant on goldenrod along the trail as well. So something you'll notice, some of the plants that these insects are on are actually old field specialist plants. And so something that's interesting about the trail that I've noticed is even in the few years that we've been walking it, since it's been established, a succession has pushed out a lot of the hosts for some of these species, or at least the, the flowers and the nectar plants that they use. So it's kind of an interesting aside that while we don't have nearly enough forest in the landscape, we also don't have very much of these transitional habitats either, these successional ones, which are important as well uh, for some of our insects. Uh, goldenrod soldier beetle, Tully ignathus, uh, probably again familiar to you. It'll start to show up here just about now on plants that are flowering along the trail. I put the emerald ash borer in here just to mention that I've seen no evidence of it. And in talking to folks with the USDA in our area, my understanding is they have not either. Um, I'm involved with the emerald ash borer genome project, have been working on this beetle in particular in different ways for quite a while. And so I'm definitely keeping an eye out for it. And, uh, you know, sad to imagine, but one of these days along that trail, we're going to see it. And sadly, uh, it's going to have a pretty big impact on that landscape. Cisindella sexcutata, the six-spotted tiger beetle. If you've walked on that asphalt trail out there pretty much anywhere between, you know, Cairville and, and the city of Memphis, or actually the Mississippi River, you'll see this thing. It can be abundant, uh, flying, sallying along the trail as a predator in, in sort of the shaded areas along the trail. Um, beautiful uh, beetle. The Big Dipper firefly, which is our commonest firefly in the area here, it is the one that is the state, um, one of the state insects here in Tennessee. The fiery searcher, Callisoma scrutator, it's a ground beetle that is a predator on caterpillars. And imagine the poor caterpillars. This wicked mouth thing will walk up to a caterpillar, slice into it, so its hemolymph comes pouring out, it's terrible. Um, and by way of that, the caterpillar loses its turgor pressure, its internal, internal hydrostatic pressure. It can't get away, and this thing proceeds to eat it. Um, they like to run around on tree trunks. Um, there's another species that's more common on the ground. You'll find these sometimes in Home Depot and in other big box stores or other stores for that matter that have automatic doors. These will either run under them or in them when they open. They don't mind being in places where there's lots of people. Unfortunately, in those places, they, they don't make their way out, but, um, but they're really charismatic and one of the bigger insects in our area. The dogbane leaf beetle, we have a few of these along the trail on some dogbane. There's literally uh, two patches of dogbane that I'm aware of um, where I've seen these beetles. Beautiful. They sequester the cardiac glycosides, which are in these plants, and use them in their own defense. Uh, this is an acorn weevil. We have several species of these along the trail feeding on various of our oaks and hickories. Uh, remarkably long mouth parts and just kind of an interesting beetle. I have a graduate student studying or, or trying to relocate one of these, one of the species in this genus that feeds on chestnut and may actually be extinct. But there are, as some of you know, some chestnut saplings or, or better put um, sprouts uh, that have come up from former chestnuts that have been hit by blight in the eastern end of the Wolf River drainage. And uh, at any rate, there is still some possibility that this weevil persists somewhere in the range of the former range of American chestnut. Periodical cicadas, we have several cicadas in our area. Of these though, I get asked about them all the time. Really the one that is most apparent to us because it's really the only one that's clearly in our area is brood 23 of the 13 year cicada. So brood X or brood 10, we didn't have those in our area here. They were in Eastern Tennessee. They were in the news this year, but not in our area. And so you can see here that there's several in Tennessee, but really the most apparent in our immediate landscape here is going to be the brood 23, which we'll expect here Oh, in another seven years or so. Velvet ants, I get emails about these all the time, uh, other, otherwise known as cow killers. They're a wasp that does not have wings. Uh, the wings are actually deciduous as I understand it. Um, and they have a pretty wicked sting. That's where they get the name cow killer. It's not so terribly bad. I have been stung uh, because I couldn't help but try to pick one up. Um, and I did that with gloves, but it made its way through the gloves. Uh, but they're a really neat day active uh, insect that knows that it can make its way about without being bothered too much. They're predators, they're relatively common, and you'll see them in our area here. 
Monarch butterflies, you don't see too much uh, in our area. They mostly are passing through and that's because we don't have much milkweed. Um, interesting thing about Western Tennessee, unlike Central and Eastern, is that you don't see much Asclepias, in particular, the species that's shown on the right here, Asclepias syriaca, the common milkweed. And so, by the way, uh, something to have in mind is uh, planting milkweeds in our landscape is a great way to increase the abundance of, of monarch butterflies in the landscape here, because there's just not many suitable hosts for these, um, in, where we live here at least anyway. The multicolored ladybug, Harmonia exoritis. This is a non-native that is here. It's abundant. Um, it is not the same as the seven spotted, of course. It can vary in coloration and patterning. It's one of those that is most abundant in people's homes. So when you find them in your home uh, in the fall and in the winter, it's usually this ladybug. It is not native, as I mentioned, and it has eliminated, it would seem, by competitive exclusion, some of our native ladybugs that we used to have here, but you can't really find anymore. Another one of the larger beetles that you'll find in our landscape, Odontotenius, as it's called, or a best beetle, a leather, patent leather beetle. Uh, these were studied by one of my graduate students uh, who recently finished, um, Christian Beza. They're kind of interesting. They're semi-social. They interact with uh, other individuals with which they're related in a log. Usually these are found in relatively large pieces of down dead wood. And so they're an important recycler of that wood. They use symbionts in their gut to help break down wood. But they're also interesting because where you don't have big down wood in the forest on the ground, you don't find these beetles. And so in relatively intact, reasonably well-functioning forest where you have different trees of different ages, including those that are dying or have already died, you see a lot greater insect diversity, not surprisingly, including beetles like these. All right, so I will have time for questions in a moment. I just wanna close with sort of a reminder in many ways because you're all well aware, but just to highlight the time in which we live. It is a pretty remarkable time. And as a biologist, if I had a choice, you know, of when would be the most remarkable time to be alive, um, I would say it's now. You know, we're living at a time when we can study life in ways we could never ever study it before remarkable, amazing ways, sequencing genomes, asking questions about how organisms do what they do. At the same time, an extraordinary diversity of life persists. It's here still. But the reality is it's quickly disappearing. And we know what to do. That's the other cool thing. I mean, wouldn't it be devastating if we were losing an extraordinary fraction of life but didn't know what to do about it? We know exactly what to do. Now, whether we're doing it or not, well, that's of course a different story. We're, we're not, we're definitely not. And so our children and our children's children will, you will be vilified. You know, they're gonna say, why in the world didn't you do what you knew you needed to? And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just wanna point out how special a time it is in the sense that we have so much to gain by taking action now rather than waiting. Some of the statistics that I share that I think are just important to bring home, you know, 83% of wild mammals no longer exist on this planet, planet. Their populations have declined by that much. Populations of marine mammals down by 80%. Plants as a whole on the terrestrial earth, there are half as many wild growing plants as there used to be. Not species, individuals. These populations have declined. We're at a point where we've lost billions of populations. We are poised to lose thousands, if not millions of species. So to put that into perspective, you know, so there have been efforts, some very, very recent, and, and I'm really proud of what's been accomplished by this. This in particular, this UN Environment Program led IPBES, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, brought together thousands of scientists to address these issues, basically saying, look, based on data, not emotion, but straight up data, we're set to lose 1 million species. And we're not talking about in the next 500 years, we're talking like the next 50 years. Almost half of amphibians, a third of sharks and rays, 25% of all mammals. Insects, of course, too. Um, and a lot contributes to this, as you know, light pollution, pesticides, climate change, habitat loss. But the first and foremost amongst these, and in fact, uh, for all of biodiversity, is habitat loss and degradation. Yes, climate change plays a role, but we've got to stop talking just about climate change. We've got to talk about habitat and biodiversity. Whoops, one more thing that's at the bottom here. It's obscured on my screen, one moment. Um, 
what I think we also need to know is that the way at which we are losing, losing insect diversity, we're poised to lose the vast majority of insects, like individuals that are flying around outside, nearly all of them in the next 100 years. We'll still have insects, but they won't be a part of your regular life. You won't see them like you do today. They won't play important roles in ecosystems, and who knows what impacts that will have. All right, so in close, what I want to share with you is that, you know, the best things that we can do are to reach out, to talk about these things, to make it clear that what we know is well established. We know what trajectory we, trajectory we are on. There's a lot of things we'd love to know that we don't, but we know enough that we know what to do. Um, as I had, was mentioned in the introduction, I'm director of the University of Memphis Center for Biodiversity Research. One of the many things that we do is seek to educate students, to inspire students, to both learn about and act on what's happening. Um, at the same time, we, all of us, the faculty that are involved and graduate students, we study biodiversity in varied and diverse ways. My last thing here, I just wanted to mention my son Joshua is actually establishing as an Eagle Scout project, a green line, a Germantown Greenway Arboretum. And so he's established uh, well, along the stretch of trail that he's working, about 55 tree species, which he'll be labeling as part of that project. The only quick picture I had of him here is him running. He's also a cross country runner and spends an awful lot of time on the trails in Germantown and Kyerville and elsewhere along the Wolf River running with his team and on his own. So with that, I'm gonna close there. Um, I know I've got a number of questions accumulated. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy though, uh, to go ahead and moderate those as we move forward. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. McKenna. That was just a wonderful, very informative presentation. Let me launch into the, the questions. Um, first is, are the unnamed species in areas where there is little human habitation? Um, no, sadly. I would say that certainly they're mostly in the tropics, but it's very easy you know, to go onto Google Earth and look at places in the tropics with remarkable human impacts happening right now and to, to know that no one has ever studied the insects in some of those places. No one. There's going to be things there that we know about from other places, but sadly a great diversity that we know nothing about. And so you can find bits and pieces of forests all over the world like that in the tropics. So unfortunately, we're losing things rapidly in, in particular the tropics, not surprisingly. Okay, thank you. Um, someone wants to know what beetle weighs a fourth of a pound? Sure. In particular, that's going to be the larvae of certain scarab beetles. So there's Dynasties Hercules uh, and a few other of the large like Goliath scarabs and so on their larvae can be really large and very heavy, heavier than the adults, uh, which is why, um, it, which is worth mention. The adults having to fly and for that matter, developing from the larva are somewhat lighter, but yeah, pretty amazing. So some of those um, Goliath scarab larvae can be on the order of a quarter pound and fit, you know, hugely in the palm of your hand, but a great big sausage looking thing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what is the purpose of ladybugs? Good question. You know, they play a lot of roles. They are predators. So they're feeding on many other insects, including things like aphids, which would have, you know, a, a great biocontrol then, of course. That's why people put ladybugs in their gardens. Um, but they're predators. They're also feeding on some plant material. Um, what's interesting too about ladybugs, you know, they're warning colored, right? They're, they're typically orange and white and black. And those are colors that tell other things not to eat them because they taste nasty. So they're sequestering compounds from what they are eating. Um, and making them, well, taste bad, if not even be more than distasteful, but actually cause an upset stomach or cause animals that eat them to actually get sick. Okay, here's another uh, theme. As far as I know, the Anthropocene has not been offic officially recognized as a geologic series or epoch, although the term is commonly used. Is that correct? You know, that's a good question. I, it's still debated, and I wouldn't count myself as in the community that is sort of academically qualified to debate that. You know, that's really a ge geologist kind of thing. From my vantage point, I think it's fair and probably worthwhile. It's a very useful designation for a lot of reasons for the work that I do. Um, but as far as geologists are concerned, I can see where they might view it as having uh, a little bit too much of a pop culture kind of connotation. But there, of course, are very clear signals for it in the geological record, not the least of which is the abundance of plastic, you know, as it's deposited. 
So great question. And I think what you've said actually really kind of addresses where we are at the moment, which is that there's not, as I understand it, at least complete agreement on that. But, but again, then I could be wrong. Um, it's certainly something though that's debated. Okay. Uh, what insects are causing all the racket lately, day and night? I assume they were cicadas, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a great question too, because there's a number of things. We, we certainly have cicadas that are calling, although I've noticed that's declined to some degree at the very moment, at least. Uh, whereas even last week, I was hearing a lot of it. I'm seeing a lot of dead cicadas on the ground, and we do have several species. Um, and so there, there could be some uh, quiet at the moment from those. We have a lot of katydids calling right now. And so at night, you do hear a lot of katydid calls from trees. And so um, that tends to be what I hear that is persistent and ongoing throughout the night. Okay. Um, let's see, I just missed one. What is the most destructive invasive insect species in Shelby County? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, most destructive. Well, I, I think it's I think it's probably in the eye of the beholder because you know, you could argue that any of a number of the sort of domesticated pests, um, which are, you know, not native here, even though they've been here for a long time, uh, would, would qualify. So I think, you know, when we get the emerald ash borer, that's going to be a mess uh, for those of us who love our, our, our wet forests in the area. We don't have it yet. So that's not the case here. Um, we have bugs, you know, hemiptera that feed on certain of our, um, some of the vines, including, you know, like kudzu and others, so like kudzu bugs, and they're hugely problematic in the places where they are abundant for a lot of different reasons. So in those places, people would find those to be pretty hugely impactful. Of course, there are non-native cockroaches that are here that I certainly find to be a big nuisance. I'm sure many of you do as well. And so, you know, and I, and I bet you I'm missing some things that would be really obvious. You know, by the way, on the ladybug point, um, Asian multicolored ladybugs are a bit of a pest at times, and they're not native. And they're certainly eating and destroying a lot of good things, good insects that are out there as well. So I'd have to think about that a little more because I guess I'm probably missing some important ones. But, but certainly there's a lot of things that would qualify at the moment. Okay. Um, here's another question. Many fellow gardeners who preach native plants have no qualms about killing squash bugs, cabbage worms, and other garden pests. Is there a way to coexist? Good question. And I suppose there is. It's a matter of whether one wants to invest the time, energy, and portions of your garden in allowing them to persist. Because, of course, you know, you, you can, um, by way of how you culture in your garden, minimize the impacts of some of these. For example, allowing certain of your plants to be fed upon, but then you are augmenting the population and increasing it. But we, what you then have to do, of course, is have active control on the other plants. Some people I've heard will grow and actually transfer the insects to those others, but the truth is they're moving back and forth and back and forth. So a stable, a persistent coexistence, not really very easy. Um, at least I can't think of a way to do that. Um, you know, there, there, there are ways, but they definitely require persistent daily movement and action. Uh, I, I, for example, have a colleague who is not a big fan of killing tomato, tomato worms, hawk moths that are feeding on their tomatoes. Um, and so we'll move those caterpillars. Um, but you have to do that pretty well every day and move them onto plants that you don't mind being obliterated <laughs> by these things as they are feeding. Um, and so it's not very easy. Again, that's a tough one and I don't have a great answer for you. Okay. Um, what can a regular person do to help save the bugs? Lots of really straightforward things. Uh, where not needed, don't have wide ranging lights at night. Have them covered in directions where they're not relevant. When you're looking out an airplane window, if you're like me, I find it really disconcerting the spread of deeply penetrating LED lights that you can see from an airplane these very bright lights that are white at night, they're bringing insects in from great distance. So turn lights off, have them on sensors. That's the best thing. Um, so that's a big thing to do. You know, we all know that pesticides uh, are a big issue. Really what we need to do is, as, as a, certainly as a nation anyway, we need to eliminate the use of neonicotinoids, uh, at least in most situations. 
Um, we've been slow to do that. There's just a lot of big issues at play here, but the reality is there are certain insecticides in particular that we really need to do something about because of their pervasive and widespread impacts on insect diversity. And just keeping in mind that, you know, if you're killing something, and we see this in our area here, a lot of the mosquito spraying that goes on by people that have folks come to their individual yards, I get it. But imagine you're not just killing those mosquitoes, you're killing pretty well everything. And so those are pretty significant, uh, that's a pretty significant impact to have, even if it's just your yard. So I think we need to be much more thoughtful. We also need more habitat. You know, let's face it, we, every day, uh, you know, the suburbs here, of course, are growing. We're losing habitat. And so we don't have enough. We need places where insects can live and persist and not have to deal with an insecticidal fogger driving by, you know, at some frequency in the summer or whatever else it is. Okay. Is there a benefit to the milkweed beetles I have all over my milkweed? Hmm. Well, if you like them, <laughs> um, the if when you say milkweed beetles, you're referring to the, the beautiful sort of tortoise looking ones that are red and black, uh, they don't tend to occur in great numbers. And while they will eat at your milkweeds, they are native. Um, Labidomera is the genus, they're, they're beautiful animals. Um, they're not particularly common uh, in our landscape here. And so if it were me, I would tolerate them as a native insect that is, well, just for its own sake, really kind of fascinating and, uh, you know, nice to see it doing well in the landscape. But beyond that, you know, short of just enjoying them, there's not really any purpose for them to be there. They are specialists though, and they won't feed on other things. That is what they eat. Okay. Um, and someone is wondering about your background. Uh, is that a mural? Can you talk about the background? Those are just, that is a, an image collage uh, I, I made the collage from images produced by a friend named Udo Schmidt, um, and he is, uh, and I say friend generally, I am acquainted with him by the internet, and he's been happy to have me use his images. So that's just an image collage that I use as a background, um, and so Zoom puts that up in the background for me. But it shows the diversity of different groups of beetles, and in that regard, I think is, is really fun to look at. Okay, and let's see, I think I have... One more. Oh, what books would you recommend for people trying to learn about insects? Oh, good question. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of good books out there about insects. Um, there, there is a book uh, for love of beetles that is fantastic and does a great job of illustrating beetles. But the truth is, if, if one were to just want to get acquainted with what's here locally, I would probably pick up some of the field guides actually, because for example, there's a Caterpillars of Eastern North America that is just truly wonderful. That does a great job of illustrating the various caterpillars you'd find here in Tennessee, as well as the adult butterflies and moths that would be reared from them. Um, but as far as specialty guides like that, there aren't too many and what you end up with are more of the general field guide types. But those are pretty well done for our area, for Eastern North America. And so, you know, most of the names that you would know that make field guides are going to be pretty good. If you want a more sort of general introduction to insects, there's a pretty awesome book by Grimaldi and Engel about the insects. And it's a hardcover deal. I don't know if they make a soft cover one. It's sort of a coffee table thing, but you might be able to get it reasonable on Amazon even used because it's pretty popular. And it's popular because it's just truly awesome in the breadth of ways that it introduces the topic from the fossil record with beautiful pictures to the time frame of history over which insects have evolved and changed and gone extinct, certain lineages that aren't alive today and so on. Uh, insects in amber, and then insects today, what they do, each of the various groups. And this coming from specialists in the field uh, that work and actively today are studying insect diversity. So I, that's a pretty awesome one that comes to mind that I would recommend. Um, again, Grimaldi and Engel, the insects. So those would be my first, first thoughts. Okay, and then I, I think that that is it for our questions. And I'm going to end with my own, which is um, a lot of us are concerned about the crisis in biodiversity and the sixth extinction that we are entering. Um, what, it, what it, are your thoughts on how all of us can help uh, to prevent or, or find solutions to that problem? Well, we need to preserve all reasonably intact habitat that's left. 
We really do. And especially in the tropics, but certainly even in areas like ours. Um, and so, you know, where we live here, there is extraordinary diversity that is threatened. And so we need reasonably intact landscape scale habitat, and we just don't have that anymore. Um, there's too much edge, there's too much impact of the human dominated landscapes around it. And it's very, very hard, even in the tropics these days, to go anywhere and have the full contingent of large animals, for example, that should be there even if it looks like wilderness. Human impacts are pervasive. So we need wilderness and wilderness is what we are rapidly, rapidly losing. The solution to that is investing in these places. And so what I mean specifically is there's wonderful land set aside in the tropics today. There's more that needs to be done in lots of places like Madagascar as an example, but we simply need to preserve what's already preserved and preserve it adequately. There's other places like our landscape here where we could use a lot more areas in preservation simply because there's nothing at a landscape scale that's adequately preserved for certain species to persist. We're gonna lose them. They're just gonna be lost because they can't manage in this sort of a landscape. So I think the things we need to do, again, we know, we know that you cannot have a single isolated population and that over time you need multiple populations interacting. And for them to interact, they have to be connected. Uh, we know these things, but we're not acting on them. And instead, as people are coming indoors more and spending less time outdoors, there's less and less appreciation for that, uh, the need for places that are still wild, still open, and places where nature can just be nature. Um. I do have to say, I, I have to make a plug for the Wolf River Conservancy and its efforts, which are hopefully we're preserving some of the habitat that you think is- Absolutely. No, and, and I, I absolutely think so. I, I'm thrilled that some of the habitats you preserve today are all that's left in places where everything else has been converted. And at the same time, I think there's some amazing opportunities still as well. So I, I think that's absolutely the case. And I, I really- my background is in, uh, at least to some degree, engagement and involvement with these sorts of things, local land conservancies and so on. So if you're looking for something as an individual to do, that's what you should do. It's not always about just investing money as an individual. Invest your time and energy. Make sure that people are aware of the opportunities that are right around them here and get involved in and donate your time if you have it, because that itself is a huge, huge thing. And again, we, we need people to be aware of, of these places around us. So, okay. Well, Dr. McKenna, thank you so much for an excellent, uh, wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it so much, and I hope everyone else did too. Thanks to all of you at home who have joined us tonight. I'd like to remind you that our next lecture is September 23rd on gardening with native plants, which is appropriate. So, please check our website for other activities and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks thank so you, much. Dr. McKenna. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dwayne. You got it. Absolutely. Great. Happy to do it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It was very inspiring to me. So.